Удобные исторические теории. Простые, стройные, известные каждому со школы. Будут опровергнуты. Забытая история. On air, forgotten history. Today we're talking about ancient China with Gleb Nasovsky. Hello, Gleb Vladimirovich. Hello. Let's start with what in your understanding constitutes ancient China and whether it existed at all. Of course, it existed. The question is, where and when? The chronology of Chinese history is a very interesting and important part of the new chronology. We've written quite a lot on this topic. Firstly, there's a large chapter in the book, Empire, dedicated to the chronology of ancient China. Secondly, there's a book called, The Piebald Horde. The History of Ancient China, in the series, New Chronology for Everyone. Also, I hope in the near future a book that has already been submitted for publication will come out, titled, The Last Journey of the Holy Family, which provides a very detailed account of the chronology and our reconstruction of the history of ancient China. I would like to start with chronology first and foremost, because the basis of our reconstruction and the basis of the new chronology is dating. There are many legends, prejudices, and beliefs about the history of ancient China existing in society, mostly based on Chinese movies. But the question arises, what evidence lies behind all of this? What proves the chronology of ancient China? How is the dating of all ancient Chinese dynasties that Chinese historians present to us proven? Mostly, astronomical datings are cited as evidence. Supposedly, the ancient Chinese were very accurate astronomers. True, by the 19th century they had lost these skills, but the ancients were very meticulous and accurately recorded astronomical events in the sky. In particular, if you listen to historians, you can hear that, supposedly, the ancient Chinese very accurately recorded the appearance of Halley's Comet. And based on these Chinese records, you can fully trace all the appearances of Halley's Comet and thereby prove the validity of the Chinese chronology. We thoroughly investigated this issue. It turned out that it's purely a promotional and rather deceitful trick. Firstly, the records of comet observations in Chinese chronicles are so dense, with over 300 observations, that you can insert the periodic appearance of almost any comet you invent into these chronicles. Just come up with any comet that appears at some period of time. We have large lists of such hypothetical comets in our books, which could theoretically appear. And we searched for their appearances in Chinese lists. All these appearances were found with a high accuracy of up to 90%. So, if the list of comet observations is too dense, you can find any comet there, even one that is made up, including Halley's Comet. That's the first point. Secondly, if we delve deeper into Halley's Comet and look at the supposed Chinese observations attributed by historians to Halley's Comet, then I referred to research from the 19th century, when this was extensively studied. Two astronomers, Cowell and Cromelin, plotted the appearance of Halley's Comet according to Chinese chronicles. And in the mid-19th century, they discovered a remarkable regularity. 
It turns out that according to Chinese chronicles, the periodicity of Halley's Comet itself exhibits a certain periodicity. That is, the time between two reappearances of Halley's Comet is not constant but fluctuates somewhat, and this fluctuation is periodic. As they believed, they discovered a law of astronomy and published a scientific paper showing that, according to Chinese chronicles, there is a sinusoidal dependence in the fluctuations of the period of Halley's Comet. So, what happened in reality? It turned out that the next reappearance of Halley's Comet flagrantly violated this periodicity and the next one violated it even more. That is, it turned out that in reality, there is no any periodicity. But why then does it appear in these Chinese records? Essentially, even from this pseudo-law, it's evident that the Chinese roster of Halley's Comet is simply a forgery. There are some other quite vivid indicators. For example, it is believed that the Chinese observed Halley's Comet for many hundreds of years, meaning they saw it in the Northern Hemisphere, as China is located in the Northern Hemisphere. But, for instance, in 1986, Halley's Comet reappeared. Did we see it? No. Why? Because it was visible only in the Southern Hemisphere. Halley's Comet is sometimes visible in the Northern Hemisphere and sometimes in the Southern Hemisphere. So, did it turn out that the Chinese in the Northern Hemisphere saw all the recurrences of Halley's Comet? No, that can't be. This means that some must have been missed, they don't have any misses, and so on and so forth. It can be strictly proven that the Chinese supposed observations of Halley's Comet are falsified. In short, according to Chinese chronicles, these observations of Halley's Comet, as they describe them, are contradicted by modern observations. So far, that's how it turns out. By observations in modern science. Okay. Moreover, if we look at Chinese astronomical observations, it becomes laughable. For example, let's open a recently published book detailing ancient Chinese astronomical observations. For instance, on the first page, it is claimed that the ancient Chinese observed sunspots as early as the Paleolithic era. As evidence, fragments of ancient Chinese ceramics are demonstrated, on which the sun is depicted as a circle with a dot in the middle. It turns out that this is an observation of sunspots by the ancient Chinese. I remind you that a circle with a dot in the middle is the European symbol of the sun in the Copernican era. When Copernicus proposed a heliocentric system, according to which the planets revolve around the sun, only then did the sun begin to be denoted with a dot in the middle. And the Chinese, naturally, borrowed this from the Europeans. And now this is evidence that the ancient Chinese, sitting in caves, observed sunspots. And so on and so forth. In fact, the entire history of China as it is presented to us, is a kind of fairy tale. It's promotional, fairy tale-like, and actually not very interesting. But genuine Chinese history, if delved into, is an exceptionally fascinating thing. To all intents and purposes, if you read our reconstruction of the history of ancient China, you'll find it very interesting to visit China and see what is there. Because ancient Chinese and medieval Chinese monuments and the history of ancient China, which is actually medieval, have a direct relevance to our history. And from the perspective of the new chronology, Chinese history is an exceptionally interesting topic. I'll give you another critical example before explaining what Chinese history actually was. In 2008, the following article was published on Lenta.ru. A tiny Swiss watch was discovered as archaeologists and journalists were making a documentary about the exploration of ancient Chinese tombs in the Guangxi region. When archaeologists tried to remove the soil wrapped around the coffin, a piece of rock suddenly dropped off and hit the ground with a metallic sound. 
At first, scientists mistook this object for a ring, but when it was cleaned of dust, it turned out to be a tiny watch, and on the back was engraved the word, Swiss. Local experts say they believe the tomb had been undisturbed since it was created during the Ming Dynasty 400 years ago. They have suspended the dig and are waiting for experts to arrive from Beijing and help them unravel the mystery of when and under what circumstances the watch ended up in the tomb. Seven years have passed since 2008 and no explanations have been given as to how the watch ended up in the ancient Chinese tomb. There is a photograph, the tomb was bronze, covered with patina, and the watch was also covered with patina. In a nutshell, in the museums of Chinese history, everything related to ancient China is fake, while everything related to medieval China is genuine. That's what I wanted to say in the critical part. If you have any questions, please ask, and then I'll continue. Yes, I have questions. It's just that people often say about the Chinese that they are famous for falsifying history, but that doesn't mean they falsified everything. It may or may not mean that. It's a matter of investigation, we investigated this question. Did you investigate it, including through archaeological excavations? I'm just trying to understand the depth of the research. No, we don't engage in archaeological excavations, we don't dig the ground. Archaeological excavations are carried out by archaeologists, and we study ancient Chinese history through written documents. Supposedly ancient documents that have reached us are plentiful, although all Chinese originals, that is, the manuscripts themselves, were not written earlier than the 17th century, but it is believed that they were carefully copied from ancient times. We study Chinese chronology using statistical and astronomical methods. Our critical analysis also applies to radiocarbon dating of Chinese history and to archaeological dating. But we don't do the dating ourselves, we just show the inconsistency of these methods. So, let's move on to the description of China from the perspective of the new chronology. Yes, let's move on. Of course, this is radio, so I can't show it, but nevertheless, I'll describe it. This result was obtained from Chinese history using mathematical statistical methods. This is the so-called relation matrix that we constructed based on Chinese annals. In principle, it can be constructed for any history. Unlike European history, Chinese history turns out to be very primitive and crude. According to purely formal results, the entire Chinese history is divided into several blocks, which ultimately all duplicate and trace back to the same short period of genuine history and that is the history of the Manchu Empire, which began in the 17th century. So, before the 17th century was there something else, that you will tell us about now? Yes, I will. I also want to talk about astronomical datings that we obtained. In fact, as for Halley's Comet, as I already said, it's a fake confirmation of Chinese chronology. But the Chinese actually have two of the oldest astronomical events related to the dawn of Chinese history. And both of these events allow for independent astronomical dating, which we have provided. One event is the horoscope during the time of the grandson of the ancient Chinese Emperor Wangdi, the Yellow Emperor. Today historians date his reign to the middle of the 3rd millennium BC. The horoscope is described in sufficient detail, and it has a date, which is March 6, 1725 AD, old calendar. Let me repeat, 1725 AD. 
Indeed, at this time, the grandson of Emperor Wangdi ruled, but a completely different one, because Wangdi is actually the clan's name of all the Manchu emperors, and at that time the grandson of the first Manchu emperor ruled. This precisely matches the Chinese annals. This is regarding the horoscope of the grandson of the first Chinese emperor, supposedly very ancient. The second event allowing for precise astronomical dating is a solar eclipse in China. It is described at the very beginning of the Xia dynasty, a very ancient Manchu dynasty. Millennia before the Common Era, yes, millennia before the Common Era. In fact, the dating of this eclipse is September 1, 1644 AD, the year of the coronation of the first Manchu emperor in China. That's what we have. We have two datings. I repeat, this is all we could extract from a fairly large volume of ancient Chinese astronomical information. There's a lot written there, but not all sufficiently detailed astronomical descriptions are suitable for dating. There are only two descriptions from which a date can be extracted, and I've listed them. That's the first. Secondly, we conducted a very large calculation based on all Chinese chronicles regarding the names of Chinese emperors, both in their hieroglyphic and phonetic forms. A large calculation was carried out, and we obtained a table, according to which statistically the entire Chinese history is a duplicate of the Manchu era. This concerns purely formal methods and results of the new chronology related to China. Of course, I understand that a listener accustomed to what is heard on the radio and seen on TV, and to what is written in various books, is probably outraged by this. Yes, because there is still no description of what actually happened according to your version. Yes, but I will still say one more thing before describing it. If you visit China, Beijing, then you will definitely be taken to the tombs of the emperors of the Ming dynasty. In fact, these are fake tombs, about which I will tell you more later. But in China, there are genuine tombs of the Manchu emperors. There are several necropolises, and we visited one of them. This necropolis is not located near Beijing, but you can reach it by bus. I remember we traveled for about three hours. No tourist buses go there. You have to take a local bus. This is the most magnificent monument. The forgery they show near Beijing, supposedly the tombs of the Ming dynasty, pale in comparison to this, the most magnificent monument with a huge number of grandiose tombs. Originally, they were sealed, but were opened, and now it is possible to enter the tomb itself. When the emperors were buried, they were tightly sealed, but in the 20th century, most of them were blown up during the Sino-Japanese War. Unfortunately, today you can only enter two of them. One is the tomb of Empress Dowager Sixi, I will talk about her later. In fact, she is not Manchu at all. She is a woman who destroyed the Manchu dynasty in the second half of the 19th century. And the second one is the tomb of the Qianlong Emperor, one of the most famous Manchu emperors of the 18th century, who ruled China for 60 years. His tomb is open, it can be visited, and I will briefly tell you about it now. A splendid huge tomb. The emperor himself and his wives and concubines are buried in it. It is completely covered with inscriptions, all vaults, all walls, and so on. And you know what? In this tomb, there is not a single Chinese character, not a single one. There is not a single ancient or medieval Chinese image, as we are used to seeing on various Chinese vases, absolutely not a single one. Everything is inscribed in Tibetan, dense writing on all walls and ceilings, and all images are purely Indian. 
This is an authentic monument that you can see and feel for yourself. I repeat, tourists are not taken there. So, what can be said about Chinese history from the perspective of new chronology? I will go straight to our reconstruction. We have all this described in detail. According to our reconstruction, ancient China is a very young country with a very ancient history. Indeed, in China, you can see something very ancient, recently made, but very ancient. I want to explain my idea. According to the new chronology, China is the final stronghold of the ancient imperial dynasty, which originated in Egypt, then ruled in the Bosporus, then in Russia, and after the Battle of Kulikovo, it was pushed off the throne and went to the east, where it created the mysterious ancient east, what we perceive as India, China, Thailand, and so on. They established states and empires of the same ancient type. The customs that prevailed there are exactly that ancientness that we have long lost. Thus, if you go to China and visit, for example, the Temple of Heaven or the Manchu Necropolis, which is made following the example of the Egyptian Valley of the Kings, where these huge structures are intended for animal sacrifices, then this is what we can read about in our ancient chronicles, how everything happened there in the time of the Iliad, in some vague distant times of ancient Greeks. You can see and touch exactly the same samples with your own hands, but made in China in the 19th century, and you can look at these ancient rituals and customs. So, I mean, China is actually a treasure trove for our history. It is the last branch of our ancient history that went to the East and left us such a rich treasury of visual aids. If I understand you correctly, according to your description, the dynasty that we had, eventually went to China after the Battle of Kulikovo and established a new branch there. First to India, then to Tibet, then to China. India, Tibet, China. There are many questions arising, but you may continue the explanation. I am ready to answer questions. Well, you are still saying that now, by going to China, we can get acquainted with what we had. But at the same time, all serious researchers of China and just travelers notice a significant difference between us and the Chinese in the philosophy of life, in the perception of reality. It's as if this empire left no trace on us. Yes, that's a very good question, thank you. So, indeed, this Manchu dynasty came to China. Once again, according to our reconstruction, they came from Russia through India, leaving there a huge number of monuments, which, by the way, are not very much talked about. This is the so-called Greco-Buddhism. These are monuments where Buddhism is mixed with ancient Greek gods. In India, they won't really show it to you much, but there is a lot of it in museums, and it's the main archaeology of northeastern India. Ruling in India until around the 16th century, they were ousted from there by Muslims and ended up in Tibet. In the early 17th century, from Tibet, not from Manchuria, they descended, conquered China, and created there the last empire of the ancient model. This was the so-called Gesar conquest. And now they are trying to portray the Manchus as some kind of wild Tungus and shamanists. But after some time, they mingled with the local population, with the Chinese. 
In fact, the Chinese have the property of absolute dominance. So when mixed with the Chinese, they become Chinese. All their traits are dominant, this is known. Let me remind our listeners that with us today is Gleb Nasovsky. We are discussing ancient China in the light of the new chronology. It's now 3.30 p.m. News. After the news, we'll return and continue. On the air is Forgotten History, and it's 3.35 p.m. Today we have Gleb Nasovsky with us, remembering ancient China. Now we move on to questions. A question was asked before the news, about why we are so different from the Chinese if they are essentially us. So far, we understood this from a genetic point of view. No, they are not us, but essentially, their history is our history. The Chinese are Chinese, and they are very different from us. The Manchus, who came to China in some numbers, actually dissolved into the Chinese by the mid-19th century, and their descendants, having mixed with the Chinese, became Chinese. The imperial court tried longest to preserve its bloodline. If we look at the portraits of Manchu emperors, not the ones drawn by the Chinese today, but the ones from their lifetimes, we'll see quite European facial features. But in the mid-19th century, a quiet coup took place at the top of power in the Manchu dynasty. In fact, it was such a rigid pyramid, in which the emperor possessed divine power. And at the top of this pyramid climbed a Chinese woman, Sixi. She ruled China for 60 years and essentially destroyed the Manchu dynasty. It's known, the Chinese know it well, and they don't really like her for squandering the treasury and so on. She didn't even speak the Manchu language. Essentially, the Chinese history that is written today with the fictitious purely Chinese Ming dynasty and all the rest, all began under the Manchus, but not under the real Manchus, but under Sixi. She appointed her own relatives as successors, not the relatives of the emperors. They were completely different people, and after that, the dynasty quickly declined. Therefore, it must be understood that formally, the Manchu dynasty declined in the early 20th century, but in fact, it ended already in the mid-19th century, before 6 C. This is important to understand because in the second half of the 19th century, Already under the Manchus, there began a purely Chinese and anti-Manchu trend in writing Chinese history. It's still not very clear. If they so aggressively assimilated even an entire empire that came to them, then it must be some profound culture, which is probably a few centuries old, if they were able to digest an entire empire so easily and effortlessly. They digested it through blood, and they took their culture for themselves, stating that it's our culture, and we invented it all ourselves. Of course, they added something of their own to it. I don't argue, but the foundations of this culture are all brought by the Manchus. Once again, the Manchus brought them a certain ancient culture. When the Chinese digested the Manchus, they declared that it's our ancient culture. Naturally, they added quite a lot of their own to it, and what they ended up with is what we have as today's China and its culture. But this ancient culture practically left no traces with us, or are there any parallels? We have a lot of traces of this culture in our written sources. I'm saying that if you want to see how things really happened with us and what is described in our ancient chronicles, you can go to China and see examples of all these accessories still existing there and fairly new. So, what we had long ago, was brought to China, and lasted in some form or another until the end of the 19th century, so you can see it and check it out. As for classic examples, let me remind you that the Chinese are credited with gunpowder, paper, and compass. These are all their inventions. And a spyglass. Yes. So what does the new chronology think about this? Again, 
It can be said that Chinese history is actually the entire path that the Manchu dynasty went through in its prehistory and brought to China. There is a branching point. History was brought to China in the early 17th century, then it was declared ancient Chinese. As a result, yes, of course, everything was invented by the Chinese. But these Chinese did not live in China before the beginning of the 17th century. That's how we can put it. In fact, these Chinese in the 17th century came from us. So, the penetration was somewhat different. The spread around the world did not come from China, but in part from us, including to China. According to the new chronology, there was only one ancient dynasty that created our civilization. In that ancient imperial center, according to our chronology, it remained in power until the end of the 14th century, until the adoption of Christianity. The center is the Mediterranean, it's first Egypt, then the Bosporus, then Russia. In the new chronology, the adoption of apostolic Christianity occurred a thousand years later. They themselves were not apostolic Christians, although they were Christians as well, but royal Christians. In our history, we call those old Christians pagans. Having come to power, the apostolic Christians called their opponents, also Christians, pagans, Hellenes, and so on and so forth. We call them royal or familiar Christians. You know, there are all sorts of ideas about what used to be in Russia. There was Rod, Puerpira, Rusalkas. It all really existed, and this ancient familiar or royal Christianity was replaced by the apostolic one in the late 14th century. This ancient royal dynasty, being displaced, expelled from the center of the empire, went to the east and created several ancient-style empires there. First in India, then for a short time in Tibet, and then in China. When we say that the Chinese invented everything, it's true and not true. It's true because in Chinese chronicles it was actually written about it, and it was true. It's untrue in the sense that it was not on the territory of modern China. The Great Wall of China, the Terracotta Warriors. Great question. The Great Wall of China in the form in which it is shown to tourists today is, of course, from the 20th century. And not only the 20th, but already the 21st, because it is being completed. If you follow it to the end, which I highly recommend, you will see how it is being completed right before our eyes. This is pure modern construction, but that doesn't mean there wasn't an ancient, old Chinese wall. It existed, it is marked on maps, and we have a lot written about it. In fact, the Wall of China was actually built by the first Manchu emperors as the border of the state they were creating. It follows exactly the border of the Manchu Empire of the early 17th century. If you go to China, I highly recommend visiting this wall, but make sure you have a good pair of binoculars. When you look from this wall towards the Mongolian steppes, you will actually see remnants of the authentic Great Wall of China. It was made of rammed earth, but of course, it doesn't have the same picturesque winding as the modern replica. It goes straight, ascending and descending hills. Nothing remains of the wall itself, but the settled rammed earth line remains, and the towers are also visible. They have also collapsed and little remains of them, but nevertheless, they are clearly visible, so you will be able to see it. But then about the terracotta army, one doesn't even need to ask, that's also modern replica, also from the 20th century, isn't it? Terracotta army. They haven't even closed the factory for their production, they are Chinese after all. Why would they? Moreover, if you go there, they'll sell you exactly the same ones. They say that our modern Chinese craftsmen can make exactly the same ones. Let me remind you of a story that happened several years ago. Then they brought this terracotta army, not all of it, of course, but some samples to Germany for an exhibition. And something happened to them there. I don't remember what exactly. In short, the Germans had to evacuate the terracotta warriors from some premises. Then they were accused of being fake. 
Yes, I'll finish, that's true. They did an analysis. Terracotta is clay. In simple terms, these are clay warriors. There has long been an analysis that allows determining whether the clay was fired in ancient times or recently. This is used to check the authenticity of supposedly ancient clay finds. Using this method, many counterfeit finds have been found. This methodology exists. Using this technique, they checked this army and found that the clay was fired recently, meaning it's a forgery. For a long time, the Chinese didn't respond to this, just like they didn't respond to Swiss watch, saying that you didn't have the right to do the analysis. Then, in the end, when the Germans apologized for what they did, indeed they didn't have the right, but did it anyway, and said, well, how do you explain it? The Chinese said, we knew you were such bad people, so we sent you copies. Therefore, it's also modern. All right, now I suggest slowly involving our audience. I remind you, today we have Gleb Nosovsky with us. We are recalling ancient China in light of the new chronology. The direct line phone number is 7373948, SMS plus 792588889484, and 8, website, govaretmoskva.ru. Listeners ask, where are the pagodas in Russia? Again, speaking of cultural differences. First of all, the architecture of ancient Russian churches was different and more diverse than today. Today we universally have only one style, one of many different examples, based on which ancient Russian churches were built. This style was introduced in the mid-17th century by the decree of Patriarch Nikon. All other churches according to different examples were being destroyed and replaced with these ones. There are still a few truly ancient churches, including those with such curved roofs, individual examples exist. So, in your opinion, there are some structures resembling pagodas? All right. So Byzantine architecture, what can be seen in Vladimir, in Kiev, is all. I don't remember exactly where, but such ones exist. We even have references to them in our books. All right, direct line 7373948. You'll need headphones. We're listening to you attentively. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. You're on air, please. Hello. My name is Gennady. I'm very glad that you have such guests. Why? Because, actually, when there are several points of view, you can find the right one. Of course, I don't entirely agree with the respected professor, but I'm very glad that there is such an opportunity. What specifically do you disagree with? Maybe there's a specific question? You know, unfortunately, there are no questions, but I'm happy to listen. Thank you. Accepted. 7373948. We're listening to you. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, you're on the air. Please. I'll lower the radio now. The question is this. Your guest keeps talking about some Manchu dynasty. But let him then explain the dynasty of Genghis Khan's descendants, the Yuan dynasty, and Emperor Kublai Khan. A European who was there, Marco Polo, wrote very well about him. How does all this fit into your fraudulent theory? Thank you, we're taking it, please. Thank you for the question. Regarding Marco Polo, this is indeed a very correct and interesting question. Reading Marco Polo, researchers have long been amazed at how he, having been in China, did not see tea there. He doesn't mention tea. Neither the Great Wall nor the small feet of Chinese women. This is a very characteristic detail. They bound their feet in tight shoes to make them small. So, actually, if you read Marco Polo's book, there are no signs of China there. This has long been noticed by our researchers, and abroad there are studies on this topic. And in our book, Empire, there is a separate chapter dedicated to Marco Polo's book, where it is proven that he had not visited China. It is necessary to understand correctly the name China itself. By the way, Russians call it Kitai, and the whole world calls it China. Pay attention to this. Russians call it Kitai. We have the word Kitai, and, by the way, Kitai Gorod which is China city. If you look at old maps, then actually western Siberia is called Kitai. 
The modern Russian name Kitai did not originally apply to present-day China. This name was later attached to it. The European name China, referring to southern China, is more correct. By the way, in Afanasy Nikitin's writings, Kitai is called China. These were two different names, China and Kitai. Therefore, when we talk about ancient journeys, and when it comes to the fact that these travelers voyaged to China, then in fact, this needs to be further investigated. Marco Polo is a vivid example of the fact that the traveler never actually visited China. Perhaps he was in Kitai, China in western Siberia, but he never visited the real China, although it is considered that he was in China. And this was not our finding. There are many studies on this topic, and we have a chapter in our book. Do you also associate Kitai Gorod, China City, specifically with the territory and not with defensive fortifications? What Kitai is and where this name came from is a separate question. Perhaps it means a defensive fortification, but this is a domain of linguistics, which is not relevant to the matter now. All right, 73739482. We're listening to you attentively. Hello. Hello. It's not even a question, but rather a bit of a misunderstanding. I'm very pleased to listen to you and overall, everything you say, but I immediately associate it with present-day Ukraine, which attributes such antiquity to itself, claiming to be Rome, Greece, and everything else under the sun. Isn't there a political agenda behind this? Thank you. Perhaps there is something remotely related to this. But actually, it's not necessarily a characteristic of the Chinese, Ukrainians, or Kazakhs. Why specifically Ukrainians? Look at what they write in other countries. They now attribute all history to themselves. Kazakhs claim that Gagarin was Kazakh, or something like that. Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, but nevertheless. Chinese are now diligently trying to prove that they had a primordial ancestor who has no relation to the rest of humanity, such an ancient pre-Chinese, and now, as far as I understand, they are promoting this theory. Wanye, two million years ago, that's true. Understand that creating a history for oneself and increasing one's weight is a natural desire of any young state, and everyone has been doing this. All of Europe was engaged in this in the 17th century. So, don't point fingers, Ukrainians, Chinese, you're like this, and we're different. It's the same for everyone. But that's exactly what you're being accused of, that you're now trying to create a new history for us. No, we're not trying to create a new history for us. We are indeed accused of this. But in fact, our research is based on purely formal chronological results. In fact, we started studying the history of Russia in the 1990s, about 20-something years after we got involved in this business. And it all started in 1973. Initially, we had no idea that Russia had such a great importance for world history, as it turned out. It just happened that way, there was no any political agenda behind this, and this is clearly seen from the history of the new chronology. That's the first thing I want to say. Secondly, still, I want to emphasize, so there are no misunderstandings. I have a very good attitude towards the Chinese, and I don't want to blame them for anything. Moreover, I believe that the Chinese are a young nation with ancient history. And both are good. They have such enthusiasm. They have youth. And at the same time, the history that was brought to them also gives them some advantage. Therefore, I'm not saying anything bad about the Chinese. But perhaps for us and for our civilization in general, this is some kind of threat. I'm not discussing this question. But from the change in history that we propose, the Chinese themselves do not lose. Confucius, Confucianism? Confucius, Confucianism, these are peripheral issues. Since they brought ancient European history with them, then, of course, there are key moments of our ancient history in it, including Christ, described partially under the name of Confucius. But the most important thing I would like to talk about is Buddhism. Confucius was heavily promoted in the 20th century under Mao Zedong, and now we have a wrong idea of the Chinese. We think that the Chinese are some Confucians and so on. The present-day mainland China has undergone communist cleansing. 
just like us, everything was closed there, and now they can say whatever they want. Go to some unaffected by communism quiet nook of China, to Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and you will see how devout the Chinese are and they have no Confucianism at all. They don't even know who Confucius is, they are pure Buddhists. In Beijing, go to the imperial forbidden city. What traces of Confucius are there? There is only Buddhism. Go to the summer palace in Beijing, only Buddhism is there. Yes, indeed, they have one temple in Beijing dedicated to Confucius. But these monuments to Confucius are from the 20th century, everything related to Confucius is from the 20th century. Look closely, you'll see. And the Manchus were by no means shamanists. They were Buddhists, and Tibet was sacred land for them. By the way, Tibet was supported by Imperial China. The Tibetan Lama had a huge temple, a whole monastery in Beijing. It still exists, I advise you to go and see. So, I want to talk about Buddhism, not Confucianism. What is Buddhism? Today we are accustomed to think that Buddhism is a religion that arose before Christ. There was a certain Indian prince, Shakyamuni, who has a very bright story, I won't retell it. He was placed in a castle, then he went out of it, met three people, went to the wise men, and then created the Buddhist faith. This story about Buddha was very popular in Europe in the 19th century because it was brought from the Orient and it was a novelty. However, in the second half of the 19th century, it was discovered that there exists a Christian work, the story of Barlam and Josephat. This story of Barlam and Josephat, by the 19th century was forgotten, but in fact, it exists in a huge number of manuscripts in many different languages. It is considered one of the most widely read works of the 15th century in Europe and in Russia. Naturally, there are many Russian manuscripts. So, the story of Barlam and Josephat is a spitting image of the Buddha story. It tells the story of a Christian preacher named Barlam, who traveled to India, where he encountered an Indian prince named Josephat, whose life story precisely mirrors the story of Buddha. He was raised in a castle, isolated from the outside world, and then went out, which is exactly the story of Buddha. This was immediately noticed, and there were many disputes on this topic, but nothing came of it, because in today's history, reconciling these two things is impossible. Why was the whole of Europe fascinated by the story of Buddha in the 15th century, but called him by a different name, although acknowledging that he was an Indian prince? And how did they learn about Buddha if Buddha and Buddhism were supposedly completely separate and independent from Christianity? In fact, quite recently, on December 2, November 19 after the Julian calendar, the Orthodox Church celebrated the feast day, the memory of Saint Joasif, the Prince of Great India, the Hermit Barlam, and Avenir, the father of Joasif. That is, this is a Christian saint, we still honor him, we still have his holiday, and in fact, this is Buddha. Why are you so sure that the cause and effect here are exactly such that the story of Barlam and Husafat appeared first, and only after that, Buddha appeared, and not vice versa? Why couldn't the Buddha's story be copied? Well, this follows from the new chronology, it is a consequence of the entire set of chronological results that we obtained. Theoretically, of course, it could have been either way, but the new chronology suggests that the sequence was exactly like that. I'll also talk about Greco-Buddhism. This is also something hidden from the people. 
We have 30 seconds left. I'll just say it in a few words. In Indian archaeology, there is the so-called Greco-Buddhism, Greco-Buddhist kings. This is Buddhism mixed with antiquity. There are various Aphrodites, Apollos, and so on. And according to the new chronology, antiquity is the royal Christianity. That's what I wanted to say. Gleb Nasovsky was with us today. We recalled ancient China in light of the new chronology. Thank you for participating in the broadcast. Come again. Thank you.